in the first place to start. This police station in Merseyside is home to the force's economic crime team, a group of financial specialists who have recovered four million pounds from criminals in one year alone. Many of these officers work undercover so we can't show their faces, and this morning, they're targeting suspects they believe may be using stolen credit card details to book flights on a popular website. Detective Sergeant Paul Kay will be leading the economic crime investigation. This initially started when Budget Airlines made the report to Merseyside Police uh, that they were receiving a large number of bookings um, via the telephone, which were made with their uh, compromised credit cards. Police want to find a phone that they think is central to the suspected fraudulent flight bookings. There's a number of phones there, and most significant I'll go through is the top number and then 6275. This is our dirty phone. Um, this has booked holidays, this has uh, under billing been seen to contact a lot of decent suppliers. The phone could be crucial evidence. Police believe the fraudsters are booking last minute flights with stolen credit card details and quickly selling them for cash to their friends. The phone may have been used to do much of the bookings. It's time to pay the suspect a visit. Merseyside Police, come to the door, bring nothing with you. Lounge is empty. Some officers surround the property, whilst others knock on the door and are soon inside. And now the team will look for paperwork and that phone that may have been used to book the flights. And whilst that house search is taking place, Merseyside police are carrying out further raids against people linked to the possible offence. At this address, the door was sawed through to allow speedy access. Police want to be sure they gather any vital evidence. When proceeds of crime officers raid a suspect's property, they look for any sign of expensive spending patterns. And items like high-end perfumes and expensive shoes are often a giveaway. You know, when you're talking that one person may have 30 pairs of shoes uh, and they may all be £100 a pair, uh, it's a lot of cash. Back at the original raid, the officers have found two suspects inside and are deciding whether to bring them in for questioning about possible offences. And one covert officer has an update. Mainly searching for electronic devices. A number of them have been seized along with a quantity of cash from inside the address. Uh, the search is still taking place, it's quite a large address. Um, so we're just making a systematic search of every room um, to see if there's any other items that require seizing. All the people targeted today will now be questioned. And at one of the addresses, they may have found the phone they think made all the bookings. We've recovered um, documentation in relation to the fraud. Um, there's also um, a lot of property which show the wealth and um, how the money that's being obtained during this fraud is being spent. The economic crime team have the power to seize anything they think could be tied back to suspected frauds. Potentially now we're going to um, assess the evidence we've obtained this morning. Um, we're going to interview the suspects this afternoon, uh, see what they've got to say for themselves. And obviously there's still a, quite a few other suspects uh, that we need to uh, locate and interview in relation to this offence. This is the spreadsheet. Later on, we see if the seized evidence reveals a credit card fraud gang. Criminals can expect to lose the fast cars and nice houses that they buy with the money they've made through crime. But that's not all. Even the items used to commit the crime can be seized and sold off by the police, taking thousands of pounds away from the criminal's grip. This is the story of two young men and how their inexperience at sea led to the discovery of a criminal enterprise. And as a result of their failings, this boat is now up for sale. The Why Not is a 30-foot yacht built in 1981 with two cabins and five berths. And it's about to be sold at the proceeds of crime auction, all thanks to the actions of its previous owners. 
This is Eastbourne in Sussex, and it was here that these two men, Harrison Law and Anthony Poyser, moored the Why Not, a boat that they just purchased for several thousand pounds. They secretly planned to take a trip to France, where they intended to make a purchase. But what they were after was something completely illegal, so their trip would have to be very much under the radar. They would have to pilot the boat themselves, a decision that would end up bringing them to the attention of the local police. Detective Constable Andrew Smith of Sussex Police works extensively on the south coast of England. He investigated the Why Not and its crew. Well, as far as I understand, they bought the boat and they had one lesson in how to sail it, which I po was possibly given by the person that previously owned the boat for about maybe an up, up to an hour, and then took it across the English Channel, which is a very busy shipping lane, very dangerous, um, took it across to France. They were willing to risk life and limb to cross the Channel. There was clearly money to be made. And when they got to France, they made their illegal purchase top quality cannabis, which the two inexperienced sailors then brought back to the UK without sinking. Well, I've never sailed myself, but I would say it's highly dangerous. You don't know what kind of weather you're going to come across, the water conditions, or indeed coming into conflict with other um, users of the channel. I think these guys were either um, very, very brave or very, very silly. Police believe the cannabis was then passed on to a crime group in London who sold it on at a massive profit. Their success with the first run made these two inexperienced sailors decide to set sail for France again. And later on, we discover if their next trip turns out to be their last. Earlier on, we saw how officers from Merseyside Police raided numerous addresses linked to a credit card scam. They seized large amounts of banking paperwork and electronic devices like computers and phones to try and find proof that people had bought flights online with someone else's card. And they found the master phone where many of the suspect bookings were allegedly made. The information on it has enabled financial specialist detective sergeant Paul Kay to build up a clearer picture of what the suspected fraudsters were doing. How the scams works is initially the fraudster will obtain credit card details of a third party. Those credit card details are then fraudulently used to buy air flights, which can be sold on for cash by the fraudsters. And then they will offer um, flights for sale, be it on the um, internet, uh, social media, uh, through a friend. By the time the fraud is discovered, the person who bought the flights has often already flown. Right, so uh, this is the spreadsheet of um, all the fraudulent transactions. You've got the 26 uh, bookings, that, uh, reference numbers down the side here. You've got the value for each flight, so you can see varies all the way down. You know, starts off £700, £100, £1,100, 1100 These are the values of the flights booked with the compromised credit cards but they were later sold on for a fraction of that price. It appears that the fraudsters are quite happy to take whatever people want. If people want a cheap flight, they'll, they'll, they'll book it for them, because at the end of the day, it's just hard cash for them. The fraudsters are making a lot of money in this because they're selling these flights to people, so people will pay them maybe in cash uh, for the flights. So if a flight's £500 and they're selling the flight for £250, they're getting the £250 in cash. They're booking the flight with a compromised credit card and they're, they're getting cash rich on the strength of these compromised credit cards. So he will be the... Uh, Paul will now gather all his evidence and decide if he can charge anyone involved. If they're convicted, he'll use his proceeds of crime powers to take away their profits or anything he can find that seems to be bought from money made illegally. At one of the addresses that we uh, executed the warrants, we seized uh, a quantity of cash. Um, we also seized uh, high-value items, um, lots of shoes. I know it sounds petty, but some of the shoes are expensive pairs of shoes. And notoriously in the past, we haven't taken them. We've left them behind. However, in the last 12 or 18 months, that hasn't been the case. We do look to take, the, take uh, high value goods. Uh, we take experts with us now who can identify goods that are worth money, jewelry, watches, um, them type of goods where we would have left them, left them maybe in the past. 
We are now seizing them items. Hold his name. The investigation will continue, but Paul's proceeds of crime powers enable him to seize any property and demand that his suspects prove how they got the money to purchase it. With numerous items now taken, it's been a successful day. Earlier on, we saw how two young men risked their lives by making a first-time crossing of the English Channel to buy cannabis in a boat they just bought. Having made it back in one piece, they decided to make a further run to France and buy more drugs, a decision fraught with danger for an inexperienced pair such as them. This is the English Coast Guard base at Dover. The officers here are very well aware of everything that goes on in the English Channel, that the two inexperienced sailors were making their way across. This is uh, arguably one of the busiest waterways in the world. We're, we're stood looking out over the Dover Strait, um, and uh, uh, in any given day, there's between 500 and 550 vessel movements in the southwest and northeast bound directions, and also upwards of 80 to 120 ferry crossings, depending upon uh, the time of day. And that means that small boats like the Why Not are sharing sea space with some hefty vessels and an array of potential threats. The area forecast for the next 24 hours. And what do the Coast Guards think of the two young smugglers only having had a one-hour sailing lesson? I would have expected any individual to have conducted some form of or, or participated in some form of formal uh, training. It would be fair to say that um, the sea uh, can be quite unforgiving. But despite the dangers, the men decided to make another crossing. They planned to buy more cannabis and sell it on. But on their return home, the men made a schoolboy error. As they sailed the Why Not back into Eastbourne Harbour, the harbour master noticed something wasn't right and called the police. They came to the North Harbour um, late in the evening, sort of half, uh, quarter past half past midnight. Um, they weren't using the correct protocols, which I believe is uh, having your mast down and the sail down, and they had all the, their lights off, which aroused the suspicion of the uh, harbour staff. Poiser and Law moored up their boat, not realising the police had been called. Moments later, officers boarded the Why Not and started searching. Went on board the vessel and found two males inside. Strong smell of cannabis coming from the uh, inside of the cabin and uh, detained the males and searched the vessel and found the drugs. The drugs were found underneath um, the seating um, within the vessel uh, and two large holdalls, um, each full of um, herbal cannabis, all packaged up for presumably delivery to uh, other criminals. Poiser and Law were about to make serious illegal money. The street value of the cannabis was uh, thought to be in the region of £250,000. They realised the game was up and they, they came quietly. In interview, the men immediately confessed what they had done. They were sentenced to two years' jail each and the law didn't stop there. Their boat, the Why Not, has now been seized and will be sold off to the highest bidder at a proceeds of crime auction. We'll find out how much money is raised from selling it. What would you spend on a luxury watch? £5,000? £10,000? Well, some criminals are spending a lot more than that. But police officers are determined to take their assets straight off their wrists. This is City of London Police financial investigator Simon Stiles. He specialises in dealing with cases of fraud. And whenever he convicts a fraudster, he confiscates their assets. Most recently, he took a watch from a man jailed for selling fake insurance. He plans to sell the fraudster's watch and pass the money back to the victims. But before he sends the watch to auction, he wants a colleague to confirm it's real. Just get out here. I don't know how much it is, whatever, a fake or anything like that. Can you just uh, run your eyes over it? It's unlikely it's a fake. There's a lot of complications on it. Yeah. So to, to actually make a fake one of this take quite a bit of work. Hublot Big Bang, I would say revaluation on them, probably about £12,000. Happy that the fraudster's watch is an expensive item, Simon sends it off to be auctioned. And a few weeks later, he arrives to see the watch get sold at a proceeds of crime sale. Everything here has been taken off criminals from across the UK, and what unites them all is they're about to be sold off to the highest bidder. 
But what were the insurance fraudsters watch fetch? Estimated retail price on this watch is maybe twenty thousand pounds. Three thousand pounds starting. Four thousand nine. Give it four thousand pounds for nothing. At five thousand nine, give it to people. Give it a watch for the minute. At five thousand, six thousand pounds. A bit of interest in this. At six thousand pounds, seven thousand pounds. Now, gentlemen, bid at seven thousand. The bid's in the hall at seven thousand pounds, and I'm going to sell at seven thousand pounds. Seven thousand five hundred. The hammer's up once, twice, third and last. It was sold for seven and a half thousand pounds. Mission accomplished. An auctioneer, Aiden, is pleased with the sale. Tublo is such a strong brand. Even though the watch didn't have any box papers or any other paperwork, uh, the brand still sort of shone through and it exceeded all of its estimates. With the watch sold, Simon intends to return the money raised to the victims. Arresting dealers may stop them selling drugs to the public, but it's the treatment for users that can really help people beat drug addiction. And in some cases, proceeds of crime money is being used to fund much-needed drug rehabilitation clinics. Addiction to alcohol or illegal narcotics is an ongoing problem in every town and city in Britain, and the people here at the basement project in Kirklees, Yorkshire, know that better than most. Everyone here at their treatment centre is an addict or former addict, and some have even committed crime to fund their habits. But now money raised at the proceeds of crime auctions and seizures is being used to take these people as far away as possible from their former lives. What makes us different, I think, as an organisation and as a community building, asset-based organisation, is that we are all in recovery ourselves. So right from the chief exec, the directors, uh, chairman of the board, we are all in long-term abstinence-based recovery ourselves, so we come from a place of real understanding. And as a former addict, Larry has a clearer understanding than most about how to engage with people with drug problems. Started using alcohol very dependently from a very young age, uh, teenage. Um, the whole history of been to prison quite a, quite a number of times, been homeless quite a, member, quite a number of times, uh, lots of crime. I never knew anyone that had got clean. I never knew anyone who knew anyone that had got clean. And um, I never had a role model. I never had a path to follow. It wasn't until I was introduced to the concept of abstinence that that revolving door finally stopped and it became an open door that I was able to walk through. But this morning, Larry is helping to fuel up a group of local people who he and his colleagues are trying to help beat substance abuse. So behind us, it's, um, it's our breakfast club. Um, it's kind of how we started as an organisation. We know from personal experience that the best time to catch someone that's in problematic drug and alcohol addiction or having issues is first thing in the morning. Um, there's a window of opportunity that opens first thing in the morning, certainly in my personal situation as well. If it was after 11 o'clock, you probably never really got me. I was far too busy. Um, tending to my addictions, my many addictions. So we thought of the idea that we'd start a breakfast club and it was predominantly about bringing people into an environment of recovery. You will be served your breakfast by someone in recovery. You will be spoken to and engaged by someone in recovery, someone that's been where you are now, someone that can talk to you in a language that perhaps you haven't heard before, you may understand better. But staff here have a unique way of occupying their users to keep their minds off drugs and drink. Exercise. Later on this afternoon, there's um, uh, an organised bike ride, again, organised by Kirklees in Recovery. They're increasing the miles, so they started off with one mile. I think the last bike ride there was a 10-mile bike ride. I'm very impressed, and I'll, I'll take my hat off to them because it's a bit more energy than I possess. And people at the centre have some impressive new bikes, which received funding from somewhere. Research shows that being active in a physical way is really useful in combating mental health issues and treating mental health issues. But it's, I think it's about people with a common goal coming together, people trying new things. So I said 50% of the people that have engaged with the bike have never rode or been out on a bike before. People coming together, they make friends, a common goal. It's healthy, it's active. Um, people are changing their diet already as a result of this. Three people have stopped smoking as a result of this. And this is just in the last three weeks. Um, I think gains in terms of physical and mental health speak for themselves, but there's also a social gain, and it's people making friends, people building relationships. 
Well, the, the basement project applied to the Save the Communities Fund and uh, they're doing some really good work around people that have been involved in substance and alcohol misuse, getting them onto positive activities, uh, repairing bikes and getting them onto an abstinence programme that means that they are hopefully taken out of the criminal justice system. The commissioner was so impressed that he opened his proceeds of crime wallet to pay for the purchase of bikes. So money taken from criminals is defiantly driving down criminality in one small corner of the world. And one person who is really benefiting from being on the scheme is Sheena. By the time I came to the basement project, I'd hit rock bottom and there was nothing left for me. I had nowhere else to go. After years of drinking three bottles of wine a day, Sheena was hospitalised. Her health was so bad that at one point, a priest was called to the hospital to say the last rites for her. But she pulled through and came to the team here at Basement for help. And that means cycling. I've done like two or three sessions now, and the first two sessions I felt really uncomfortable. I felt out of my comfort zone. And with the help of the, everybody else, a team effort, I've been started to enjoy it, and everyone's, everyone's been so supportive for me. And do you know what? It brings us together. It's a good laugh. It's for health and well-being. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it for me, but I'm going to show everybody that I can do it. But how the project got their bikes is a surprise to the people riding them. So basically, to bring it back and then to give it to people to do something productive with themselves, with their lives, to me, that's priceless, and that's what life's all about. So, you know, I thank the police commission and everybody who's, who's supported us to, to do this because it makes us feel that we're a part of it and we're e equal to everybody else. And to me, that's what it's all about. And other people being helped can see a direct link to their own lives. The Basement Project does help to reduce crime, obviously. I committed crimes to fund my drug habit when I was using. I stopped using through the Basement Project. I don't commit crime anymore. I pay taxes now. You know, yeah, of course it does. And others didn't realise they needed help like this until they started getting involved. I was addicted to alcohol for 25 years. Um, I've been, like, I was really struggling with it. Um, I was totally unmanageable. Um, I was, like, I was quite violent when I was a, when I was a drinker as well. Um, I, try, I tried my best to, like, to not to do it, but it's just like a, a massive compulsion to, to carry on doing what I was doing. But for Rob, Looking after his health has proved to be a game changer. Well, the, the cycling's all part of a keep fit regime that I do anyway, and it sort of helps me to keep out of my addiction, addictive behaviours. I think it's like leaving your problems at the door, really, and, you know, getting on with, like, it's just between you and the machine, really. So I think that it's, it's a great idea. Which makes organisers feel their time and the crook's money has been well spent. Charities in the UK have received tens of millions of pounds seized from criminals. But the method of raising the money to give back to good causes often starts with a proceeds of crime auction. Earlier on, we saw how inexperienced sailors Harrison Law and Anthony Poyser bought the sailing yacht Why Not and used it to smuggle cannabis from France to England. But their cannabis was found by police at Eastbourne Harbour. The street value of the cannabis was uh, thought to be in the region of £250,000. And as a result, the two men were jailed for importing cannabis, which leaves this attractive yacht looking for a new owner. It'll be up to the proceeds of crime team auctioneers to get it sold. The things we do is we sell assets land, sea and air for the different uh, enforcement agencies across the UK. And as many cars and Rolexes and motorbikes we sell, we sell boats and we sell aircraft. So if, if the UK government can seize the asset, then it'll make its way to us to be sold, to get us to put the money back into the public purse. But will this boat sell? It's called the Why Not. Perfect name. It's built in 1981. And it's a 30-foot sailing yacht. The first commission bid kicks things off at £4,000. So it's at £4,000. Looking for £500. At £4,000. 5000 straight in. At £5,000. I'll take it down to 250 It's at £5,000 on lot number 80. Seems incredible value for a 30-foot sailing yacht. At £5,000. £52,50 now. But that's not all. It's at 52.50. 55 straight in. New bidder at 55. Bidder at 5,500 pounds on the ceiling now. 57 now. 58 now. Bidder at 5,800. At 5,800. Bidder at 5,800.